So welcome to the second episode of the Fruity Knitting Podcast, and I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew. We're broadcasting today from our Offenbach studio. Uh, we're back from Northern Wales, um, which we loved. It does seem like more than two weeks okay, our since off- we recorded. Our Offenbach studio is actually our house. And that's our dining table there. So we are back in our house and the first episode was in um, Snowdonia. And although you saw the first episode two weeks ago, there is a little bit more time (laughs) has passed. I think think we did a traditional first podcast thing where there was a little bit of time before having the idea and actually recording and and uploading. (laughs) But uh, we're all right with that. Yeah. So. So here we are. Um, yeah, welcome and thank you so much for all the lovely comments that we received on our uh, Fruity Knitting Ravelry group and on the YouTube and also on Instagram. So, And I'm Fruity Knitting on all of those um, mediums. But there were some really, really encouraging comments and that was so nice to, to hear. And um, so thank you very much for taking the time to do that. Yep. Um, yeah. So what have we got coming up? Um, Well, Snowdonia is still very much in our hearts, so we've got uh, two... Segments. Two segments where we're going back to Snowdonia and showing you some very exciting interview and another little special (laughs) So we've got got inside and outside covered, which I'm really happy about it. Um, It's it's a clear thing that we love our holidays in uh, northern Wales, in Snowdonia. yeah, I pretty much look forward to them for about eight months every year. Yes, that is That's our nice. one big holiday, actually. We usually go for a big holiday um, once a year and, yeah, and look forward for, it for, a full, for a full year to the next <laughs> year's holiday. Yep. Yeah. So. So let's do our next segment, which is bring and brag, and that is where we bring our finished objects. And we've got a few of those because it's been a little longer than two weeks. <laughs> since you last saw us. And the first thing is I showed you this blanket coat um, that I was knitting on or that actually Madeline was, and I, my daughter, was um, knitting on together. Well, that's since been finished. So I'm going to show you that in detail today and I'm also going to show you Madeline in it, which is a good idea. So. I might just tell you to. I have to go. (laughs) You have to go already. It was short and sweet. (laughs) Yes. So, Madeline, can you come and maybe you can put this coat on and... Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, we have finished this lovely big coat and Madeline has done the majority of the knitting, haven't you? Yes, I have. (laughs) She did the sewing. And some less difficult parts. Yeah, yeah. I'll let her have a go. So do you want to pass me that book again? And um, yeah, so this this design is, for those of you who haven't seen the first episode, is by Kim Hargraves and it's from her book Still. And um, most of the designs in here are really simple but elegant designs and they're great for beginning knitters. And... Which is really the point because you knitted the whole, pretty much the whole thing, didn't you, yourself? Yeah. And, and yeah. you're not really an avid knitter. No. <laughs> so it's done out of the brushed fleece and that is a blend, it's a Rowan yarn and it's a blend of baby alpaca and fine merino wool. And what's really amazing about this, and I said it last week, last, uh, 
last episode, but I'll say it again, is that it's a chunky wool, but it's really light. So you've got in, in a coat, and you can't really see unless she was to stand up, but put it on over here. There's quite a lot of fabric. It goes down to about this much underneath your bum area. So even though it's it's a chunky wool, it's not dense and it's not heavy. It's actually really, really light. And that's what's amazing about this this wool for this um, this kind of construction. Mm. Yeah, so how about I show you? And what I might do also is put some photos up of this, of Madeline modelling it, because Madeline is such a pretty girl. <laughs> and we, we went down to the – we've got this factory um, – just around the corner from our house and it's got a really beautiful brick wall walls so yeah. it's a fantastic area to do um to, to photograph garments and so we went there and it was actually quite cold wasn't it yeah it was really really cold like i think i mean it must have been three degrees or zero or something anyway so i was standing there and all i had was a singlet and a top on and um, I had this on top and I was fine. I mean, it really surprised me. It kept me so warm. Yeah. Of course, after like 40 minutes or something, I did start getting cold, but I was very surprised. Yes. So I'm going to show you a little bit about the construction of the coat. And can you sit on the side and face that way? So you've got the back section and then you've got the front section here. And um, that, so this panel here, you pretty well just knit straight up and then you'll, you'll cast off here for the shoulders and then you'll cast on some extra stitches for, for this part of the hood and then you just continue knitting straight up, stocking stitch all the way up to the top. And, and then here, about here it starts, you start doing some decreases so you get a nice little curve here and then straight off the top there. So, and then you do this exactly the same on the other side, so face me this side. <laughs> Okay, so that's a panel that's done straight up there. And in the end, you just simply sew, seam the back of the hood here and, and seam it onto the back of the, the back section of the, of the coat. And then you do the arm um, separately. So it's actually, it's a simple construction. And just along the sides, Sorry. you've got uh, two stitches of garter that so everything's in stocking stitch except for the edge and that's in garter stitch and that just sort of does just a little decorative edge and that goes all the way around the hood as well so you we've actually finished this a few weeks ago and you've been wearing it a lot haven't you yeah just yeah. almost every day when she's um down doing her homework in her bedroom i see her cuddled up in this yes so yeah so thank you madeline <laughs> So I've done a tutorial on, on um, that project. So now it's time for Andrew to rejoin us. And um, yeah, so if you want to, Madeline, just throw me the garment without it getting caught on the camera. Brilliant. Um, yeah, so I did mention in the, in the podcast episode last week that I'd like to do some tutorials. And I am going to do that. And I got some really good feedback from people saying that they'd love to see me do tutorials on particularly Fair Isle and, and, and the difficult, intricate works that I've done. And I'm definitely going to do that. But I wanted to start off, first of all, tutorials that are very simple. And the reason being is um, everything that I've learned that's been difficult, all diff difficult techniques, I've actually learned through following patterns. So I suppose I just want to encourage people to, um, if they can, to get over that fear and to start getting into patterns and a whole world will open up to you because you'll learn, you'll learn to do many different things. You'll learn how to shape different armholes. You'll learn how to do cabling. Um, yeah, so all these techniques are often written in great patterns. So I wanted to start off my first tutorial particularly on a garment knit a garment to, to knit a garment and um, to encourage anybody who can knit and purl confidently and cast on to just get cracking and start a garment so you know not to be scared of that so yeah. Andrew when are you going to start your first garment <laughs> I, well yeah so my very first tutorial which I am going to put out probably in about a week is based on this garment okay so 
I'm not going to tell you the, the technical details of this, as in, when I say technical details, I'm not going to tell you how many stitches you need to cast on, so you will definitely need to buy the pattern. But I'm going to go through and show you everything that I do, so how I sew up the seams, how I cast on, how I do my decreases, um, and just, you know, how I cast on for the, for the back of the hood, all of those technical things. So it's a bit like having someone hold your hand if it's your first garment. So you can f the, follow the pattern, um, but then you've got a reference point. And I think this is such a great garment and it would fit all different kinds of body sizes. So I'm starting with this one. And you may, even if you're not going to knit this, you might uh, learn a few techniques just by watching it. And it's a pretty long tutorial because I've already filmed it. But I've broken it up into different sec uh, sections. So, and there'll be links to them. So it's very easy to skip to something that you might want to see. You might want to see how do I sew up um, a, uh, a sleeve seam or how do I insert and sew in a set in sleeve. So you can skip to that section and see me do it. Yeah, so, and this is to encourage beginners to get out there and get into a garment as fast as possible. <laughs> and the other thing which I find is great about this is a lot of stocking stitch, but really knitting is only a combination of two stitches, knit and purl, and everything else. So fancy cables, fancy lace, fair isle, all of that is just maneuvering, knitting and purling stitches. So in my experience, the, if you're a beginner knitter, the best thing you can do is do quite a bit of stocking stitch to start off with. So practicing your knit and your purl until you get both of those the same gauge and that you get a bit of speed going. And as soon as you've done that, you're really in a position to try really exciting techniques. And a project like this, um, you'll get lots of experience doing that. <laughs> there's a few, yeah, there's a few stitches there. Yeah. Um, we saw somebody, Mina, right? Mina, some people will know Mina from the expat podcast. Yeah, yeah. She gave us her statistics and her statistics included how many kilometres of yarn she had knitted in the month. So you got to clock up those miles. Get the experience. It does help, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. At so least that's what I'm told. <laughs> yeah. My, if if you are joining us for the first time today, my knitting experience essentially dates back to episode one. So, um, yeah, I pretty much. Uh, well, maybe not, a couple of weeks before, before episode that. one. There's not much before <laughs> that. There's not a lot of miles of, of yeah. meeting in there before yeah. that. But, um, yeah. Okay. So that's the first bring and brag. And a lot of this has to go, the credit has to go to Madeline, who has knitted most of it. So well done, Madeline. Did you mention the, the book? Yeah. Yes. And it is, so if you are interested in, and I'm going to hopefully put some pictures up, in this podcast so you'll get to see um, this coat in more detail. But if you do want to knit it, it's in this book uh, still and um, we'll have links to where you can buy that. And there's quite a few other designs in here which I'm going to do tutorials in. So it is, you know, worth the, worth the um, investment. This also what I'm wearing is in here and I've done a tutorial on that. So I'll come to that in a minute, but it's now your turn. Cool. Um, I'll mention just very quickly, um, do check the program notes, everything. We've, we haven't got long explanations of anything in there at the moment. Maybe we'll do that sometime. But we do have links to everything. So everything that we mention is in the program notes. And also you can go to fruityknitting.com um, if you can remember that. And uh, the same stuff is in there and there's a link to the podcast as well. So that's all there. So, what are we on? Bring and brag. Finish things. I have to say, I, we saw this on the first episode and I was working away. And um, what I have I've to confess... have done about that much. The, the, yeah. The hat is now finished. I have to, we have to be straight about this and say, I started it and Andrea finished it. <laughs> um, 
that was a, a hijacking case. So, but um, I can say, I mean, I did a lot. Yeah, let me just explain the hijacking. That's because I thought I was in my, I'm going to do lots of tutorial mode, and I thought this is a brilliant pattern to do a tutorial on, to encourage people who have never done cables to knit cables. Yep. So cables. that's why I took over and filmed it. Yeah. But look, at, there's no difference here. <laughs> Andrew's work, Andrea's work. It's seamless. Beautiful. Yep. That's so true. That's, that's actually because my... when he was learning to knit, I really um, put a lot of pressure on him to do a good gauge. To, to it was a lot of pressure <laughs> to learn to knit his pearl um, and his knit in the same gauge, so yeah. it's very even. Here we see and pearls also, and knits in the same gauge. Here. I also taught him pretty well to knit a gauge that's very similar to mine. Yeah as well as Madeline. So that actually so means that I can start projects and then outsource them. them off. I can be a ghost <laughs> knitter. A ghost yeah. knitter. So when, all those things you see on Ravelry, on, on Instagram, on, on Ravelry as well, just ask yourself whether Andrea really knit that. Right. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, what we can see here is there's knit stitches, there's pearl stitches, and there's one row of cabling, okay, in this hat. This is the... Called a beanie by Sarah Hatton. Yeah. It's a Ravelry pattern, yeah. It's free. It's a free yeah, Ravelry. It's a free Ravelry pattern. I think we found that you need to register with um, Rowan. No, you oh, can no, get sorry. it. There's two ways. Okay. It, it's a Rowan pattern is what I meant to say. Yeah. It's, so on the Rowan website, you can um, download it. And uh, you don't... Oh, maybe you do need to register. I'm not, I'm I'm not, not sure. sure. But I'm registered, so I, I don't know. But you can actually get it. It's translated into... It's in English... French and German so you can get it in all those different languages and I think you just click on their online uh, collection and you can just type in Col Col Beanie and you'll find it but you can also find it on the Ravelry page um, just under patterns put in um, Col Beanie and it'll come up there yep. okay so it's a very easy pattern to find yep and it's an easy pattern to niche it is I mean there are cables here it's just a two by two rib. Every 10 rows, there's a cable row. And I have to say the cable row for me was not straightforward. It's, it's really tight. It's kind of... It's a difficult cable cables. row because normally yeah. with a basic cable, all you're doing is um, uh, moving a set of stitches either to the right or to the left. Okay, so a basic cable that might sort of turn like this that's that's very simple. You just after about four or five rows, you just move these stitches over here, continue knitting, and then move them over again like that. This one on the on the tenth row, your um, huh, you're turning stitches around and keeping a pearl stitch up, uh, pearl stitches through here. So it is quite tricky, but it only comes up every 10 rows. And in total, you only have to do it one, two, three, four, five times in the hat. So it's only five difficult rows out of the whole hat. And the rest is very simple. So I've made a tutorial on this, which I will release sometime in the future. And um, it's, I still think it's an excellent pattern for, for someone to learn to do cabling on particularly since of, uh, if you watch my tutorial, it'll be like having someone holding your hand and yeah. showing you every step of the way. So it is knitted with a seam up the back. So any experienced knitter does not need to do that. They could easily change the pattern to knit it in the round. We did it with a seam because I wanted to do a tutorial on it and I wanted to just follow exactly the pattern so that people can learn to read patterns and, and follow them primarily and so that I didn't have to do any um, alterations on the maths and it would be yeah. just simply easier to film it and, and show. So again, all the tutorials that I'm doing on patterns, I, I don't tell you the, the amount of stitches you need or any of the details, so you definitely still need the pattern. But I show you the techniques. Yeah. Yep. It's a good, uh, as far as doing a seam, it's a good project to practice doing a seam on because it's not huge. Yeah. This is what always gets me about um, garment knitting, what I always think, right? 
um, is if you mess something up on the garment where you've put in all lots of hours of work, then that's pretty sad. But if you mess up the seam on this, then really you can just pull it apart and do it again. But, you and know, you, you can't, it's very difficult to mess up a seam on a garment. It really okay. is. It's all about just pinning it. You just need dressmaking pins. And if you pin it neatly, sewing up is very yep. easy. So... <laughs> yeah, I have sat through these. Um, I, I do some of the technical work on these uh, tutorials. tutorials and yeah. so I've, I do know some of this stuff very much in theory. But yeah. let's just say what the wool is. It's yep. a, um, a super wash, DK, Rowan, pure wool. And as you saw, this went up to the highest altitude in England and Wales and it was rather wild and windy <laughs> and rainy up there so it was very good to have something that I could chuck in the washing machine without a care and um, I like to do that with with hats that we go hiking on because they're inevitably going to get really dirty or muddy or something Wet. so yeah good cool so that was joint effort you've got something else haven't you yes ah I'm wearing. there it is <laughs> sorry that was probably terribly loud and so this is the temperate and there's a picture of it here. It's also by Kim Hargraves. And okay, so I used a different wall to her. She, um, this pattern, I'm trying to find it very quickly. So did you explain to everyone you're talking about what you're wearing? Yeah, what I'm wearing. Okay. Here it is. So she suggests that you use the Rowan Mohair Haze and gosh, what did I, what am I, what did I use? <laughs> oh, what's this called? It's a DK and it's the, I think it's, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's um, Baby Alpaca and Fine Merino, this wool here, and it's a DK blend. And I am totally in love with this wool. It's actually meant to be knit at a, um, a wider gauge than what was in here but I thought I'm going to use it and knit it into a denser fabric which I've done and I totally love it it is so soft it, it's just really really beautiful and I've got it like I've got it on bare skin there's nothing you know I'm wearing nothing underneath and it's not in the least bit scratchy I think probably because it's baby alpaca but it's incredibly soft and warm and beautiful um, so I've proven that you can knit it at, a, at a, a tight gauge, a very tight gauge, and it's still very soft and drapey. So, yeah, I love it. And it comes in stunning colours, and I love this colour. Um, I think I called it purpley last time, but it's really like eggplant, like an eggplant. Eggplant, yes, yellow and white. That was just Sorry. a little reference to it's, Kath yeah. and Kim, which uh, probably nobody knows about except for yeah. any Australian. So now we have to put that link in the, uh, the program. In the pro I'll try to find that. <laughs> Kath and Kim is a very funny uh, comedy Australian act. And um, Kath tells her husband, no, Kim tells her husband that she wants to decorate the house in eggplant. And he hasn't heard of eggplant, so he does it white and yellow like egg. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds really stupid, but it's actually really funny. Yeah. Okay, so this this is in this book as well, and it's um, just a lovely fitted. It's got some shaping along here, and the main um, details are these lovely frilly edges here on the cuffs. And if I stay here, maybe you can see it. So around the edge of the hem and that is done by um, knitting uh, four times the amount of stitches that you end up with and then uh, decreasing in the first row to half and in the second row decreasing again to half and that causes this beautiful little frilly pocket edge so yeah again I've done and it's another detail which I really love is the shape of the collar so it's sort of like a boat neck um, and the collar itself is just, so after you've knit the front and the back and you sew it up at the, at the um, shoulder seams, you cast or you, you pick up stitches around the neck and you knit it in reverse stocking stitch 
and then it naturally curls around itself. So this is on the pearl side, you may not be able to see this, but this is the pearl side and it's naturally curling around back on itself and it just creates a really nice edge. Yeah, so I've done a tutorial on this. Um, again, you would need to have the pattern because I don't give the, the details of the sizing and how many stitches, but I just walk you through it, showing you every technique you need to be able to knit it. So if you like it, and I want to encourage any beginners, if you can knit and purl and you really love these, then get into it. There's a lot of knitting in it, but it's simple. Yeah. So, yeah, we mentioned that we're going back to, um, to Northern Wales and Snowdonia. We go to this wool mill. Um, it's been around, I think it came into the family in 1859. So they've had it in their family for about 150 years or a bit more. Um, before that, it was running for about 30 years. So it's, it's getting on to 200 years old. This old machinery is still running. They make um, beautiful bedspreads and rugs. Mm. Um, in the Welsh design. So yeah. it, they, they've used um, patterns which um, I think some of the patterns are over 100 years old that they've been continually producing. So very traditional Welsh, Welsh designs. If you're Welsh or you know and you've got that in your heritage, you would probably recognise it. Um, and a lot of their customers are from around the world. They've got an online shop and, um, and they buy these beautiful bedspreads or um, throws that you can have on a couch um, as heirlooms because they last so long. And, and the woolen mill also had a, a little um, museum section to it and where they're showing actual bedspreads from the 1930s, which were bought in the 1930s and then used for many, many years. And then the owner died and the family donated, after all those years of, of use, the bedspread back to the museum. And you can't tell that it's been used. Like the dyes are just as strong and there's nothing threadbare about it at all. It no. looks perfectly new, which is no. amazing. So it's definitely, if you, if you are Welsh or you've got Welsh heritage and you're looking for a really special gift for a wedding present or even, say, a graduation present or anything that um, <coughs> you'll be able to keep as a family heirloom, then this is definitely the place to go and get something really beautiful. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And they also, something that I really um, I appreciated was um, they also have some very modern... Um, bags and things. Yeah. So I thought they were really stylish. Yeah, so they do tweed mm. as well and, and they've yeah. made them into really gorgeous um, handbags and travel bags and purses. Yeah. So, yeah, check it out online and if you're lucky enough to get or to be able to get up that way, then uh, it's definitely worth a visit and um, a big thank you to Brian and to yeah. the owner whose, whose yeah. name I can't get. I can't remember either. Hello, um, though. <laughs> yeah. So enjoy it and we'll be back. We'll have a cup of tea while you watch this. Yes. <laughs>
Okay, so we've got Brian here, and we're at the. Um, now our Welsh is really bad, so you have to let us. You have to inform us. Is it Trefeli or no? Trevrew. 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 Trevrew Woolen Mills. Which translates as Hill Town. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you've been working here. Were you trained here as an apprentice? Is that right? It's on the job training. Yeah. It, it's not so, so much a, an apprenticeship. It's just okay. on the job training. Yeah. yeah. You, you you learn to weave, you learn to card the wool, you learn to spin the wool. Okay. It's, yeah. you, you have to be able to do everything in a small mill like this. And you started at 16? I started at 16. And that was in... 1966, a long time ago now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So you lived in the area and you just decided, I think I might like to get into weaving or it was a job that was available? It was just a job that was available at the okay. time. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, w once I left here, I went to another Woolen Mills, uh, which is 10 miles down the road. Sadly, that's gone now. Yeah. Um, after that, I ended up in an aluminium rolling mill, which was t 10 miles down the road as well. Okay. But again, that was went, and so I, I was lucky enough to come back here yeah. and do something like this. So it, was, it was brilliant, really. So are the woolen mills just slowly closing down, or they have over um, the last 50 years? The, the last 50 years, most of the mills in North Wales have gone. There are two left now, which is ourselves here in Trevew and a smaller mill in Brinkhead, which is by between Carnarvon and Port Maddock. Okay. We're the only two. There are a few down in the South Wales and, and Mid Wales, but not up here in the North, there's only the two left. So why do you think these have survived? What's, what's helped this one particularly stay? I, to be honest, I have no idea. It's quality, probably. Yeah. It's, um, quality will always sell. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's probably down to quality. Okay. Because this business has stayed in the family since 19, uh, 1859, uh, isn't it? Yeah, and it was going as a, a fulling mill before then, for about 30 years before. What, what's that? What's a fulling mill, it, 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 in, in them days, uh, 160, 170 years ago, most of the um, the cloth was woven in the, in the farm houses and the cottages, okay. and they used to bring yeah. it here to finish it. Okay. which is uh, washing it and, and um, shrinking it a little bit and then using teasels to brush them up. There is an example there I can show you after. Okay, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Strangely enough, that, that's the only thing we can't do here now. Okay. We have to send it away to get done. And why is that? Is it just too much? It, it's for the amount of brushed work we yeah. do. It's probably not worth the investment in yeah. the machinery and what have okay. you. So that, uh, yeah. that's probably why we don't do it now. So at 16, you got to use these amazing contraptions, <laughs> or not quite. <laughs> uh, well, the way I went around, the, the carding is, is um, the first step in, in, in the woolen industry. So I started off carding, then I moved on okay, to so spinning. Okay, so just let's go to carding, exactly what is carding? And it's what is it? Carding is, is turning raw wool into an unspun thread. And okay. then obviously the spinning is taking the unspun thread onto the spinning machines and that turns it into a thread that you can actually use. Okay, yeah. And then after that obviously you, you start weaving. Do you have to send it away to dye first or do you dye also here? It's all dyed here. It's all yeah. dyed here, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And what kind of wool are you using? Because we're here in Wales, there's sheep everywhere. <laughs> There are more sheep in Wales than there are people. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sadly, Actually, we don't use any of it. Okay. Um, but they do get shorn, don't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, um, so their wool, is it just not high enough it's, quality? Or? Um, the Welsh mountain sheep wool is too coarse for what we use. Okay. Uh, apart, from what I've been told, it, it's fit for the carpet industry, and, okay. and that's about yeah. it. Yeah. But um, the Welsh mountain sheep are, are bred for the meat, not for the wool. Okay, yeah. So where do you get your wool from? New Zealand. New Zealand. <laughs> 50, okay. per, 50 percent is New Zealand. Merino, is Merino. that right? Yeah. And I think that, uh, there's two breeds. It's um, New Zealand Merino and Corridale. Okay. Uh, the, the, the blend we like is them two wolves 20, and another 25 percent of Shetland when we can get it. It's Everybody wants the Shetland wool, yeah. and the other 25% is Shetland is, wool. Yeah, it's lovely soft wool. <laughs> it is, and, yeah. And um, the other 25% <laughs> is Dorset. That's the blend we like. Okay. Can't always get it. I yeah. think we were getting wool from Finland last year or the year before. Okay. It's, 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 so why do you why do you need that kind of fleece? Is it 
it's is it short is it long it's it's, it's a mixture it's yeah. um the new zealand wool we, we bring in is to strengthen the finished product okay and the, the shetland wool as you know is soft bouncy stuff yeah. and what have it you. Is, so yeah. that the mixture gives us the perfect blend okay so you're producing these beautiful rolls of material which mainly go for quilts is that right these are bedspreads okay yeah. and um but they, they will cut, cut them up it's slight fault in them they might cut them up and make cushion covers and okay stuff, stuff okay. like that the, the main use is, is bedspreads so just tell me a little bit about the machine because it's um it's looking quite old-fashioned to me so <laughs> it's an antique isn't it no it's not an antique Right. Sorry for moving about. No, the, yeah. This machine is a Dob Cross loom, and this one was manufactured in 1965. Most people, when they come here, think they're Victorian, but um, okay. uh, they're not quite that old. They don't last that long. But we did scrap one about five years ago with 1899 stamped on it, and we kept loads of bits off it because it'll still fit this one, even though there's nearly a hundred years difference in, in the manufacture. Uh, they got them up and running and basically they changed very little on them until the electronics started coming along. Okay. So, so okay. They stopped making them like this about the 1970 mark. Okay. The, the, this is the pattern chain uh, and what this chain will do is, is through the levers on the top it makes these 16 wooden frames go up and down in a sequence. So it's lifting and dropping different coloured threads at different times but in a sequence repeats that sequence and that gives you a pattern there's, there's a smaller or a narrower chain that runs alongside it and that's what's called the box chain and what the box chain does it makes these boxes with the shuttles in them go up and down so this mallet can hit the right shuttle out at the right time so if you take these two chains away it, it basically won't work the, the loom's making that square at the moment so what, what happens the, the grey, there's a one shuttle with grey in it and that's your main colour, that's your main colour there so that the grey shuttle needs to go out every other so while it's making that square there it'll use obviously the navy blue shuttle which is that one there so it's going to use these two boxes until it's finished that square <laughs> It's finished that square now, there now, so what it's going to do, it's going to make one of them small white squares now. Okay, so okay. It, it's, again, it leaves the grey shuttle and uh, obviously it leaves the white one until it's done that square. <laughs> This is the shuttle that's going backwards and forwards and uh, yeah. that's the woolen bobbin that's on the inside of it and that's what feeds the, the thread and watch it me. what it's doing is going back and forwards just dragging the thread behind okay. it obviously yeah. that's going to run out so I have yeah. to keep an eye on yeah. that and what we have here is all these threads coming through here there's two and a half thousand of them they're under tension they snap and so I have to keep an eye on that as well Basically, that's what a weaver does. Okay, um, yeah. The machine does the rest for you. Yeah. I guess I'm telling you, two and a half thousand thread a year, each one 120 yards long. It gets it gets fed through slowly, and it comes obviously comes to the end. We'll stop weaving about a couple of feet from the end of these frames here, tie them all off in sections at the back. Then we'll put a, a new beam with different colours in it, and then somebody has to tie the new beam into the old beam by hand, that's two and a half thousand knots for somebody. Wow. <laughs> I can usually be busy just doing something else that day, it's uh, <laughs> not the best job in the world. <laughs> this design on here, th th this was woven in the late 1800s and the only difference between this bedspread and the one I was weaving is um, the main pattern's exactly the same but they had a border around the older bedspread. The, They've gone out of fashion, we've taken the, the borders out. But the main pattern's exactly the same as what I'm weaving now. So that this pattern has 
stood the test of time and it's still as popular as ever. This was probably woven in Trevue. Uh, these are examples from other mills that used to be in the area. This was an old one from Hollywell, gone. This is a uh, one I worked in um, for a, two or three years in the mid 70s. Um, that's sadly gone again. These are Trevi woolen mills from the 1970s. Okay, that's a nice, yeah. I mean, so, some of these uh, woven in the 1930s. Th th this has actually been sold to the general public. People have passed on, nobody wanted them, and they've been donated back to, to the mill. But as you can see, the colours are still fast on them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that one's the 1930s, 1940s. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's beautiful. It's the blue the, here. The, People come in here to see me weaving and then they say I'm going in the shop to buy one of them. I usually tell them, well you make sure you like the colour because you're going to have to have them a long, long time. They're going yeah. to last you a lifetime. Yeah, so this is, okay, this is donated back to you probably after many years of, of yeah, wear. Yeah, I've Yeah. It's amazing. And how do you wash these? Do they have to be dry cleaned or can you? Well, on, on the label it says dry clean only. Yeah. But, um, I, my sister's got one. <laughs> and what does she do? Uh, she puts it in a bath. She puts it, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. It's, um, yeah, she worries more about drying it than, than actually washing it. Yeah, and so how does she dry it? Waits for a sunny day, which is... <laughs> and then put, lays it outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, she hangs out on the line, so yeah. you know, it's, um, it's, we, we have the, the, the cottage across the yard, and then we have craft people in there who, who will demonstrate hand weaving, hand spinning, solar dyeing, what have you. Um, they use the plants from the weaver's garden to do the solar dyeing, whereas okay. we have to use um, yeah. chemical dyes to get the consistency in the colours and yeah. what have you. So originally in say 1859 or when it was first taken over by this family, were they? what kind of dyes were they using? Were they um, using... Trevi Bedsford 19th century natural dyes. Okay, so that would be dyes that you'd have in your weaver's garden? Yeah. But it's gone from, you know, raw wool basically in, yeah. into that now. Okay, in, it's yeah. gone halfway through the carding process. Okay. Yes, my my grandmother was a spinner, oh, hand right. spinner, and um, she ended up having a really good sense of fleece. I remember as a little girl going to a whole lot of different um, shearing sheds where they'd have tables of different of pure fleece. Yeah, yeah. And she'd go and test, and she ended up being quite a good tester. I know nothing about it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, what it's like now, unspun thread. It's uh, you just pull it apart and, and that's it. Okay. it you, know, you can't yeah. work with it. Yeah, yeah. So what we need to do is take these spools, <coughs> sorry, up to the top floor and we'll, we'll put, uh, put it on the spinning machines. You see the reels on the back? Yeah. <coughs> that's that unspun thread that I showed you downstairs. Mm -hmm. The carriageway on the front will come out drawing wool off, off the reels at the back and as it's coming out to the end of the reel, reels here it's spinning it it'll come to the end give it a good hard spin and as it's going back in it'll wind itself onto the cones you see on the bottom there I'll try and put it on but I'm not promising it's a bit like me this machine it doesn't like cold weather <laughs> It's really set up for mass production, isn't it? Again, one with the frames, and it's made into hanks. Remember when you had to hold yep. your hand out? Yeah, and, uh, still do. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So that's it in hank form there. And that, after it's been made into hanks, this is when we wash it again, dye it, and then it's brought back up here, in, obviously in the different colours that we need. They were weaving this colour when I was here in 1960s, the old X, X pattern. Okay. And again, you know, these, these are 
just waiting. I mean, that one, we can barely keep up with demand for that one. That's I, the, that I can see that that one would be yeah. very popular. Yeah. It's, it's very elegant, but traditional. That, that's a very old pattern. Yeah. yeah. Yes. If I'm going to nip, yes. you're going to have to talk. Yes. <laughs> I'm planning to talk. There's, there's no way I'm knitting and talking at the same time. That's fine. You just, you just um, knit away and if need by, I'll put a picture, a photograph <laughs> over the top of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can, if we you're can looking particularly stupid. <laughs> we, can do, we can do some really clever video stuff and put somebody else's hands in here. Yes, knitting yeah. away furiously. Yeah, Maybe just, Nina. Just, Nina, yeah, we'll who Nina. knits so fast. Yeah, my body in Nina's <laughs> hands. <laughs> That'll be cool. Okay. Good. So I hope you enjoyed that interview um, and, yeah, and perhaps are inspired if you're Welsh or even if you're not Welsh to um, get yourself a heirloom throw or bedspread. Uh, I think they uh, ship or post all around the world. I want to show you the things that I bought from there and I bought this great uh, tweed fabric and you can get these in a whole heap of beautiful colours and it's a skirt length um, and it comes with its own uh, matching uh, lining and little zipper so it's everything I need to make a skirt and I also bought a scarf so that I'll be able to wear this scarf with my skirt and look very dapper when when I found the right pattern okay so um, the next thing we're going to talk about is under construction yeah so you're you're knitting away are you I, still talking yes All right. <laughs> and I am doing a scarf and I'll show you the pattern you may have seen this already this is the the Rowan knitting and crochet magazine number 58 from last winter and this is the scarf that I'm knitting and it's a pattern by Martin Story who is very well known for his wonderful cable work and this is a great pattern I love it um, it's very cleverly designed and it's actually very easy and I've done a tutorial on it so <laughs> <laughs> so anybody who would like to knit it will be able to follow my tutorial and again I have to say clearly you will have to buy the pattern because I'm not letting you know all the details of how many stitches or anything. I just show you the techniques. But you can buy this. You don't have to buy the book to buy this pattern. You can buy it as a separate pattern on Ravelry. And it's called Windy Scarf. Windy as in the wind. Yeah. So I'm, I'm now going to show you mine. And it's a very long scarf. So... Here it is here. And it's a great design. As you'll see in this picture, they've got two colours. They've got a darker grey and a light grey. And the light grey in, in this model here has been used for the, for the cables. And the dark grey is uh, the stripe, one of the stripes in the background. And I've just reversed it. So I've used my darker colour to, to do the uh, cables. But I love this design for many reasons. First of all, it's such a great 3D visual image because you've got these very very poppy um, cables which stand out and then you've got a background that from a little distance also looks textured because you've got the stripes in it. So it's a, it's a garter stitch background which is um, also a lovely background as a contrast to the cable panels here which are in stocking stitch. And how it's done is... Um, Okay, so you, you don't have to, you don't have endless uh, ends that you have to weave in. There's no problem like that because it's just two two rows in each colour. So 
knitting forward and knitting back and then swapping the colour and then you just drag the, the colour that you haven't used up one side. So that's really neat. And so my colour B I'm calling my light colour. Whenever I'm doing that light colour I just simply slip the stitches of the cable without knitting them. So I slip them over to my right side needle and carry um, the thread or, or my yeah my my yarn that the working yarn behind so you can't see it um, and and then so for two rows the cables aren't knitted and they're and then you continue to knit them when you when you're doing um, the colour of the cable that sounded so long winded. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> you weren't listening. Okay. So I'm sorry if I've confused you with that yeah. explanation, but it is really quite simple. And for most of the time, you're only moving the cables a little bit in one direction. So it's, um, although it looks, it, it's a great pattern for a beginner cabler because it looks really complicated and really impressive, but it's, it's very doable. Yeah. And on the back side, you can see I have I've obviously got to finish knitting it and blocking it, but you can see it's got sort of like a diamond quilting effect. So that's really neat too. And I'm doing this in the Rowan Pure Wool Worsted. Um, huh, what colour way am I doing it? I haven't got it with me. I'll put it in the show notes. So I'm doing these two colours here, and this blue is really beautiful. It's it's definitely a blue, but there's a ton, uh, it's sort of a little bit sea greeny as well. It's got that shade in it. So it gives it a very rich look. And um, when I started knitting it, Madeline came look, along and looked at it and she said, oh, that's a fantastic Harry Potter scarf. And I thought, is it? And then I thought, yeah, it is. And um, the podcast... Uh, inside number 23 yeah. with Katie she's doing a knit along that is Harry Potter themed so I thought I'm going to enter it into the Harry Potter themed knit along I've actually never done a carl before a knit along so it's um, a Ravenclaw and it's a little bit I'm cheating a little bit because in the film Ravenclaw colours are blue and bronze no not in the film in the book but in the film um, the Ravenclaw colours are silver and blue and this does sort of look silver even though it's sort of a light blue but I hope it's acceptable. Anyway, it's a Ravenclaw scarf for Andrew because Andrew is definitely... I'm a Ravenclaw. A Ravenclaw personality. <laughs> and hello to my fellow Ravenclaw viewer. Pearls and lace, was it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we had we had surrounded a bit of, by Slytherins. Yes, we had a bit uh, of fun, we, uh, you know, um, chatting on Instagram with, um, with the, the two-year-old doing parcel tongue. Yeah. which was <laughs> this uh, viewer was saying that um, it was great to hear of another Ravenclaw because she's isolated in her family of Slytherins and. Madeline actually said to us, oh, that sounds scary. I wonder if she feels left out when they're all speaking parcel tongue. Yeah. <laughs> and, and she wrote back saying, yes, particularly when the two-year-old is speaking it. But, um, yeah. but at least she knows when they're up to mischief because they all start speaking parcel tongue. Okay. I thought that was quite funny. Anyway, so that's my um, under construction windy scarf. Now it's my turn. We have documentary evidence that I am actually knitting these socks. All right. So I'm going to stop because, like I said, knitting and talking at the same time, no chance. Okay. Okay. But as, as for last week, I'm impressed. All right. And I've got to say, all right, we have to be completely clear about this, um, without Andrea's help, uh, possibly I would get to something like this. But... There would be variations in there, I'm sure, okay? Because funny things happen along the way and, um, and I sort of go crying off to Andrea and get her to help me out of it. But um, actually, the thing is, quite often you say to me, what have I done here? And it's and almost nothing, but that's fine. But if you don't know how to get out of it... Yeah, but I mean, you know, this is just a little piece of advice for beginning um, knitters. If your stitch... Don't be a wuss. <laughs> don't be a wuss. Wait. 
gone. If your stitch looks strange on your needle, just take it off the needle and, and play around with a bit and have a look. And, and pretty soon you'll see either you've got the stitch from the row beneath as well as your current stitch on the needle or you've got it back the front or you've split the wool. These are often things that Andrew gets worried about. I and do worry. <laughs> I do worry. It's these not socks, such a big, yeah. These socks are for Andrea, and I was thinking, you know, you've said that you're really, really looking forward to having these socks, and, I am. and you'll really, really appreciate it, right? I will. But you just, you know, you have to be clear about what you're going to be paying for these socks. Paying? What do you mean? Well, it's all costing me grey hairs. Grey hairs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, personally, I've got nothing against grey hairs. As you can see, I'm doing this two socks at a time with the magic loop yeah and one ball of wool so we're using both ends of the ball of <laughs> wool at the same time right that's a bit like burning the candle at both ends mm. um as a beginner knitter all right with my history going back a little bit before the last episode um it's for me, it's not that straightforward. I'm really pleased to be on to just doing knit stitches now rather than doing the, the knit to pearl to rib on the cuffs. It's just that bit easier. I have to say I find it awkward. And if I was just doing one sock on the needles and only, um, you know, one ball of wool per sock. Uh, it would be a lot more simple. It would be sure. easier. So that was... I'm not going to die from this and I'll get through and they're, they're coming to... along. Yeah. But it is awkward. I don't know if anyone could bear to watch while I was knitting there. <laughs> um, you know, starting each end is pretty painful. I've been careful about not doing the, the ladder at the edge here. So you really have to put some muscle in and, and pull it tight at the edges so that you don't get the funny ladder going up the I think side. your gauge is looking beautiful. That I am amazed about because I have to say the stitches look pretty good. And I wanted to ask Andrea, you you made us a pair of socks for Christmas. I did. A, a year ago. Yes. So. Was your, were your needles this small? Well, this this gets I, into... I I've to, only ever knitted... Do I need to go and get the socks? Because it takes quite a bit of knitting to get a bit of length in here. Yes, I mean, yes, I yes. have suggested that they're long enough and Andrea said, that, no, they're not long enough. No, I like, I like them long. But no, I've please. actually, I'm not actually a stock Can... knitter. I've only uh, well, ever that, knitted... Uh, yeah, well, I wanted to get <laughs> on to that. Sure. Actually, I, I, I was going to mention, I am reading a little bit about statistics at the yes. moment. And so I was inspired. I've done some preparation here. And I was thought what we could do was we could do a little bit of a survey because this is right. a journey for me, all right? It's a this journey. This is totally for... new for me. I have no idea what he's <laughs> about to spring on me. This is my knitting German journey, journey mm -hmm. in Germany. And so I thought we could do a bit of a questionnaire and, and sort of see how I'm going in my, my progress as a knitter. Okay. So I've got some questions for you. Yes. How many socks have you knitted? Three. <laughs> Sorry, let's try that question again. How many socks have you knitted? Six. Very good. <laughs> yes, six socks. Okay. This next question is a... So for me, I'm going to say, well, that's sort of one two. third of a sock. <laughs> one third of one sock. Have you used the two socks at once on a magic loop technique? No. No. That was, that's an easy question. Andrew, yes. <laughs> I can see where this How is many getting... scarves has, have you knitted? Uh, none. Okay. This, Andrea? This is my first scarf. Yeah, all right. I'll give you a three quarters on that. <laughs> and Andrew, one. What scarf have you knitted? We can, we can pull out. Oh, yeah, yes, we've got, yes, it's, yes, it's, yes. It's, it's, we've got the evidence. Yes. How many hats have you knitted? Now, yeah, yeah. I've knitted um, nearly three. I'd say 2.75. Yes. And I've knitted... <laughs> 1.5. Yeah. Oh, yes, you did. You have. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you done double knitting? Have I done double knitting? We want to keep this... No. No. Andrew, no. Um, have you done cables? Yes. Yes. Andrew, yes. Okay. Um, have you done colourful work? Yes. Yes. <laughs> You've done colourful work. Andrew, yes. All right, we've seen it here. Colourful You've done... <laughs> Colourful work. <laughs> this is your yeah, colourful. Yeah, all with different colours. Okay. Um, next question is, have you done brioche? Brioche. That is 
double Just to answer the question. No. No. Okay, Andrew, also no. Um, how many hand-knitted jumpers do you have? Do I have? <laughs> I couldn't count. I'd have to sit here and think about it. Because, uh, because uh, this is live television here. Oh, my goodness. Give us a quick number. Maybe ten? Ten. Okay. I've got to say three. You? Yeah. Got three. Oh, to have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, so actually, you need to you've take some off. Actually, you've got four. I have four. Four, yes. Yes, that's true. I've knitted four, so four for four, you. And those four actually have to come off your number, so you're at six. <laughs> that's, right. that's all. I hope so I you can understand get, this because I don't understand I what I just he's wanted doing. to get a little... Cause, so, I mean, that's pretty encouraging. So I'm actually coming along with my knitting experience very quickly. So you're comparing your numbers with mine? Yeah, look, like I said, okay. we need to do the statistical analysis on it. We can do that another time, but first impressions are, you know... <laughs> are encouraging. Yeah. So let's get back to this. And, um, yeah... What I was going to say is that yeah. I'm not actually a sock knitter. Um, I know there's a lot of people who love to knit socks and there's some fantastic patterns out there. and But I've never been inspired to knit socks. But I love wearing them. I totally love homemade um, knitted socks. And so I've said to Andrew that to every jumper that I knit him, he has to yeah. knit me a pair of socks. That is only fair. It's two things that I have to do for every one that you do. <laughs> so he has to catch up pretty fast because he has three beautiful jumpers that I've knitted him. And they're really, when I say beautiful, they're totally successful. They fit him really well. There's nothing wrong with them. So I'm expecting three beautiful, nothing wrong with them pairs of socks. Pairs of socks, yes. <laughs> but Not anyway, I've only ever well. knitted three pairs of socks and they, they, they were last year. And how it started was, it actually started because Andrew, first of all, made a, um, a comment of, if I was going to not knit, I would probably knit socks. And so I just jumped on that immediately. And it was his birthday two weeks later. So I bought him a beautiful um, skein and I wrapped it up and said, here you go, <laughs> it's your skein. And um, you, can knit yourself, you can knit yourself a pair of socks. And of course he didn't because he was too busy. So I said, okay, it's probably not fair for me to buy you a skein for your birthday. I will knit you a pair of Scott socks. <laughs> so I knitted the first cake pair. cake ingredients for your birthday. And then Madeline's, Madeline's birthday was two weeks later and she loved the socks, so I knitted her a pair. And then I thought, this isn't fair. I need a pair for myself because I can't be lusting after theirs. And so that, that was the three pairs of socks. And maybe I'll even stick a picture over Andrew's knitting and you can see the, the only three pairs of socks that I've knitted. So, yeah. moving on. We're, we're still aiming to get this episode inside an hour, aren't yes, we? Yes, yes. So good. quick, 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 quick. Oh, we've got something else special. We said we've got... Two features from Snowdonia. Yes. We've been inside and now it's time to go outside. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a walk that we've done twice. We did it. We've had two visits to Snowdonia and we've, we've done this walk twice. It's called... Sorry, I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> you uh, need glasses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fisherman's the, Trail. Okay. Yeah, it's the Fisherman's Path and Kumbuchen, I think it's called. Oh, Kumbuchen. these Welsh names. Good. Yeah. That's Kum with C-W-M, right? That's how you spell Kum. And I think that means valley. Um, yeah, so we've put together some photos of, of this beautiful fisherman's pathway walk. And um, just as some backing to the photos, we've just um, got a Celtic song. So, But Andrea is singing. Yeah. It, just to, to explain it, Andrea is a singer and um, she has sung in every little town in Germany. Not um, quite. <laughs> Well, almost. We go walking anywhere and Andrea says, oh, I sang in that church. That's what's coming up. Enjoy it. We'll be back in a moment after another cup of tea. <laughs> Down by the
welcome back. I hope that was a lovely little relaxing three minutes or so for you. Um, a little break from our chit-chat. <laughs> Interlude. Yeah. Um, and as you can see, Snowdonia is really, really beautiful and certainly worth a place to visit or holiday in. So now it's up to... Uh, from the archives. That's right. Yes. And that's where... It's really a section on me <laughs> where I get to talk about uh, projects that I've done in the not so distant. In the more distant past. In the more distant past, yeah. exactly. So today I'm going to talk about this design here, which is called Ashy. And it is knitted by Lisa, it's designed by Lisa Richardson, who is a designer for Rowan. And I love this design. Maybe sit on the edge of your seat a bit more and then we can see a little bit more. I first of all saw it in, it's in the um, magazine, the winter magazine, the Rowan magazine number 56. And this is the, the picture of it here. And what I loved about it was it's a, a combination of cables and tartan. And Andrew, being um, Scottish descent, inbred Scottish descent, <laughs> <laughs> as in four generations ago, uh, Doigs came from Scotland and then they married their cousins, Doig, who also came from Scotland yeah. in Australia. That's why he's so smart. He's a Ravenclaw. Um, <laughs> just add that little bit of family history. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, so it's Scottish. It certainly uh, suits Andrew Doig. And um, so I love the design of it, but I couldn't imagine it really on Andrew, uh, mainly I think because the picture here, it looked quite loose fitted. And Andrew is a very slim man and... Yeah, you also made a few comments about this the gorgeous, guy. <laughs> gorgeous model here. Yeah, yes, that's which, true. Yeah. But I'm a bit, bit concerned about seeing him in the house. Again, sure, sure. <laughs> this is my segment. <laughs> Anyway, so I saw this design, I thought it was great, but because it's quite baggy here, I, I really didn't think it was something that was going to suit Andrew until I saw another um, blog, a knitter, and he's got a blog called Knitting Conrad, he's German, and it's Conrad is spelled with a K, and I saw him on Ravelry, he did this one, and he is a fantastic knitter, so he's really worth going and checking out, he knits all kinds of techniques from cables, fair isle, intarsia, intricate lace. He also takes um, some designs which were for made for women and he masculinizes them <laughs> and, and makes it suitable for a man. Well, he knitted this design and he knitted it so it's very fitted and it looked great on him. And then just, just seeing that, I thought, ah, I can do it. I can do it for Andrew, no problems. So I thought I'm going to rework the colours. And I picked this um, mid-tone blue, um, which I think looks fantastic on him and I think would really suit a lot of people. And, of course, then I changed the um, this rather bright blue to a... It's almost white, but it's not. It's it's an off-white off with, with blue tonings. And I think, I think this colour combination looks really, really great. So... Um, yeah, and it's made out of the fine tweed, the Rowan fine tweed, which is a really lovely tweedy um, wool, 100% wool. And if you watch the podcast uh, episode one, I show you a catkin, which is by, uh, designed by Kate um, Davies that I knitted. And I knitted it in this yellow colour here, this mustard colour. So um, do you want to take it off and then I will show you how it's, how it's done and, and how I did it. Yeah, so thanks to Knitting Conrad, I was inspired to knit this jumper. So, it's um, the main section here, so you can do your knitting now. Get back to work. <laughs> Get back to work on my socks. Yeah. This is knitted in pieces. So quite often with Fair Isle, it's easiest to knit it in the round because that means you are only ever uh, Knitting instead of purling, it's a lot harder to purl in Fair Isle, fair isle than, than to knit. But this is done in pieces, so you do the front section and the back section separately. And it's a combination, 
the colour work is a combination of intarsia and ferrar. So if you look at it and you can see the stripes, you just imagine that's just simply as if you were knitting a stripe. So the colours that are going this way, like the green, the, the white here, the, the dark, uh, which is actually a very dark navy blue, dark stripe here. If you imagine just knitting them as stripes, as if you're just doing, going to do a stripy jumper. And then you've got the, the threads coming this way. So they are typically used um, or knitted in intarsia, which means that you have for every, every one of these uh, colours here, and you can see in the red you've got three, and then you've got three blue ones, one yellow going this way, and three blue here. You would have uh, um, long strands, maybe two, two metres of, of the blue or the red, and you'd make it into a bobbin and as you knit across you would just knit that stitch, that single stitch in that colour. So you, that means that you've got a whole lot of bobbins hanging off the bottom of your of your work. So what I did, because that's the more you've got the more annoying it is obviously, is that I would fair aisle, so I would only have for this say this blue section here, I would only have one blue bobbin and when I came to knitting it, I would fair aisle it across and then leave the bobbin hanging here and that would be on the knit side and then when I turned back and did the purl side, I would purl it back in a fair aisle fashion back to here and leave it there and then when I turned around on the knit, I was ready again to fair aisle it. So I fair aisled these colours back and forth, obviously not the, the yellow one because that's only, that's a two stitch, that's why it's thicker and it only goes up in this direction. So that saved me having multiple bob, um, bobbins. I only had, so a blue one there, red, blue, red, blue, red and blue. So that's, that was a lot easier. So I'll turn this inside out and you can have a look how it's done. So this was new for me because I'd never ferruled in, in on pearl before and that was at first difficult but by the time you do one, you know, when I first started here I thought what have I got myself into, this is going to take me forever but by the time you've got up here you've really got into a rhythm of it and it's, and it's really not so hard. So if you can see the inside of it you can see, uh, maybe not quite so clear, but I'll, I'll hold it like this. Will it still be in focus? No. Okay. Could you, would you mind just we holding can, this? Yeah. We can take a photo. Yeah. So I have um, ferile. You can see there's a bit more ferile-y uh, movement here of, of this um blue section and the red section you can see that's been fair aisled back and forth but only in this segment it doesn't continue on so yeah that's how that was done yeah and then the um, I'll tell you about the neck as well if I find the pattern again I did notice that the neck was rather sloppy on the picture his, they've got a, a scarf here so that kind of covers up the look and the, it still looks good. But you can see that the neck is really quite wide and sloppy and, and if you can remember my story about the cookie mon monster jumper for Andrew and what a failure that was and it was all basically because the neck was too sloppy and it just made the arms all hang down way longer. I've got a, a thing about sloppy necks. So... To avoid that, and, and that often happens um, through uh, textured garments. So if you've, got, if you've got weight in the garment, then naturally it's going to hang off more. And this, this garment is constructed very well in the fact that it's got a saddle shoulder. If you can see this piece coming from the, an extension from the arm piece, a small section continues up here. And that's a really traditional construction and it is to help give support and it's in all of the old fisherman jumpers you'll see in Gansies, you'll quite often see a saddle shoulder and that's to give a heavy weighted wool fabric support over here so it doesn't um, 
pull down on the shoulders. So it does have that, that's excellent. But it was only, it's a two by two rib for the collar, but it was only, um, uh, how do you say that, just, just straight up and then casting off. And I wanted to make it a double thickness so that it would also give it a bit more structure. So I knitted it to twice the length and then I um, turned it around and sewed it in here, but I didn't actually sew it. What I did is, normally when you do a, co uh, a collar like this, you finish your front piece and the back piece and you do the sewing up and then you pick up stitches around the neck to knit the, the, the collar band. So picking up the stitches will cause you to have a little bit of a ridge on the inside. So when I had knitted this collar to be double the length and turned it over, I simply just slipped my needle into the ridge and, um, and, and made the stitch out of that. So in a sense, it's like sewing it as you're knitting and then cast off. That's a technique thing that I can show in detail sometime. But that, that's how I did that. So I'm happy with that. That's made the collar stiffer or, or stronger. And this is a really great cable design. It's very intricate, on, on, but not overpowering on the, on the sleeves. So for Andrew, I knitted a size small. <laughs> Good. Glad we got that in. <laughs> and um, made the sleeves extra long. Yeah. So... That's under construction. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> That's from the archives. From the archives. And it is an, another absolutely beautiful jumper. Yeah. Which I love. Um, <clears throat> and it fits beautifully. And I'm a very lucky guy yeah. to be able to wear a jumper like that. And I love looking at you in it. <laughs> oh, well, that's good too. So it's a win-win. Yeah. Right, extreme knitting. We don't have a real extreme knitting. We've had our bit of outdoors, and uh, for this good. episode, for this episode, yes. Um, we, uh, I think, we might have intimidated people. Last, if if you haven't seen the first episode, then go back and watch the first episode, and you will see that we um, did get to the top of Mount Snowdon, which is the highest mountain in England and Wales, and Andrea did break. Is a spoil in the episode, but did break the world record for the highest knitting in England and Wales. And let me just say a really quick story here, because somebody asked um, yeah. asked us, did anyone make any comments while I was up there at the summit knitting? And some old codger <laughs> with a really rough a Welsh accent Jeez. came up to me and said, "Sorry, I can't imitate it, so I'm not going to try. But sorry, love, to t uh, sorry to, to break this to you, but you're not the first to be knitting up at this altitude because my wife sat exactly where you are and knitted me a jumper. And because I'm so cold and I'm knitting and the wind is blowing and our dog is barking at seagulls and it's all kind of crazy." I didn't register to, to really think about what he said. And I said, oh, really? That's amazing. And then afterwards I thought, hang on, who the hell would sit in this temperature and knit a whole jumper? And then he was watching me from a distance and he came back and said, it's all right, love, you're the first. I was only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, yeah. Sorry, that was our, our extreme knitting, but we did say we're not going to match that every week. We, we unfortunately... Yeah, it's don't... downhill from now. <laughs> Uh, so that, but um, yeah, whatever. If you've got any photos or video of yourself knitting or any evidence that you have been knitting in some unusual place, beautiful spots, or you know, nature or is great, or anything challenging. Yes, it's just basically for, for knitters who are so obsessed that they have to take their knitting everywhere. And it can end up being in an extreme situation, but you're still knitting. Yeah. Um, that's kind of fun. So if you've got a photo or you can get someone to take a photo of you doing it, then we've got a thread in our Ravelry group. And that'll be fun for people to look at. Another example I'm thinking of is when my mum came to visit me. Um, and I'm a, actually a monogamous, monogamous knitter. So I, I knit a project and I just knit it no matter what. So I'm knitting it if I'm watching a movie or if I'm... On my, on my way somewhere and so I had one of my Alistair Moore Fair Isles and we'd sit down and we're on the train to town which only takes 12 minutes 
and I'd put my bag next to me really fast. I'd get out my chart, stick it on. Uh, it's balancing half on my bag and half on the cigarette thing that comes out. And then I get out my two balls of wool and I'm knitting away while I'm chatting to mum and checking and then writing it down. And she said to me, is it really worth all that effort just for a couple of rows? And I said, of course. <laughs> and so that's an example of extreme knitting. It's just obsessed knitting. So you're knitting wherever you are. So if you've got something funny like that, um, take a photo and put it in the thread. Yeah, the thread's in your own ravelry. <laughs> Jack just wanted to say a quick hello. Oh, don't, 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 don't. He's very silly because he's, not, he's never allowed on the couch. And I think he's... Um, <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, you silly boy? Don't lick you. <laughs> He's going to lick Andrew to death. Yeah. Okay. So, Jack, you've got to, if you want to say hello, Jack, you have to actually get up and Don't say hello. Look. Stop it. Here. Crazy boy. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a crazy dog. Anyway, thanks for joining us again. I hope there's been not too much chatter and um, there's been enough technical stuff for you. Yeah. Um, let us know if there's anything that you would like to know more about. Um, I will put it, start putting out my tutorials and I'm also just going to put out some technique videos. And I know there's hundreds of technique videos out there already on how to knit, how to purl, how to cast off. But I'm just going to put down a list so it's easy to find if you are interested. Yeah, and as I said, the first tutorials that I'm going to do are aimed at beginners, are aimed at people who can knit and purl but would really like to get into... Um, garment knitting or um, would like to start their first cabling or their first fair isle project so that's what I'm doing and then over time I will add more and more uh, tricky techniques yep so thanks for joining us um, we'll be aiming for, to have our next episode out in about two weeks we are coming into our rhythm but that's what we're aiming for yeah. um, we appreciate you coming along please subscribe so that you don't miss the next exciting episode of the Fruity Knitting Podcast. And, and thank you very much for viewing and thank you very much for your really encouraging compliments and, and comments.